Yeah, dear friends, welcome to our presentation by Andrew Linnell, Sacred Geometry as Path to the Astral World. Andrew Linnell is co founder of MISTEC and uh, anthroposophical organization seeking to realize Rudolf Steiner's indications on mechanical occultism. For many years, he served as a president of, uh, of the Boston branch of the Anthroposophical Society, the Natural Science section, and as admin for several anthroposophical Facebook groups. In 2013, he retired from 42-year career in the computer industry when he had served as CTO and uh, vice president for, sol for small companies. He is the author of nine books, two for children, and Andrew, Andrew speaking to us from Boston. Dear Andrew, over to you. Thank you for joining us. Oh, Andre, thank you. I, I'm very, very happy to be part of uh, all of this, and let's just see if I can uh, let's try that. Well, yes. Um, so I, you all can see my, have I done the share screen? I guess I haven't yet, have I? <laughs> Sorry about that. And all right, so now that should work, right? And um, speaking of introductions, what I hope to offer you in this webinar will, I hate to say it, but barely introduce you to this deep and broad topic. Some of you may be far more expert than I am on this topic. So my goal through giving you some examples and all is to show how geometry was once the framework for spiritual experiences and can once again aid us to find new paths to spiritual awareness and knowledge. As Rudolf Steiner remarked in 1904, you may become a student of the mysteries only when you have learned to think about the being of nature and of spiritual existence wholly free of sense perception, just as a mathematician does regarding a circle and its laws. That should stand in gold letters before anyone who really seeks the truth. Much of what we'll cover comes from Rudolf Steiner's The Fourth Dimension, where he summarized these lectures. Oh, and by the way, and on if you don't know what the book looks like and all that. Um, so he, he said this about it. We will always remain powerless in the higher world if we do not develop faculties that permit us to see in the higher world while we are here in the world of ordinary consciousness. The eyes we use for seeing in the physical sense perceptible world develop when we are still in the womb, of course. Similarly, we must develop supersensory organs when we are still in the womb of the earth, so to speak so that we can be born into higher worlds as seers. Mentally constructing the relationship of the third dimension to the fourth fosters inner forces that will permit you to see into real, not mathematical, real four-dimensional space. So this webinar will focus on constructing that relationship this will at best offer a foundation to projective geometry and to offer a few insights into sacred geometry. How can geometry do this? Why should I care about geometry? Well, Plato told us that God geometrizes. It leads to knowledge through understanding, polarities, and we'll also discuss multi-dimensions, which has become a popular topic in modern physics, such as string theory, which quickly comes to four dimensions and then theorizes as many as 11 dimensions. All this in order to reveal a path, a path to knowing the astral world. Astral world? Sometimes Steiner used the expression astral plane. At times in the next hour, 
you might feel I am wandering like this road. Our goal is to use geometry to go from the familiar, that is the physical, to grasping with our imagination, the etheric. Then with this foundation, one can begin to explore the astral plane. Steiner discusses three planes, which are sometimes called spheres and sometimes called worlds. These three are the physical, the astral, and Devakon, which has a lower and an upper realm. It might seem odd that in these three planes, there is no mention of the etheric. That is because in this view from the spiritual, the etheric belongs with the physical. In fact, from the spiritual, the physical is experienced as an illusion. Now, if one inquires about geometry, one finds that there are many kinds. Euclidean is what we all learned in high school. Oddly, this was originally based on the sacred geometry used in the mystery centers and was the sacred geometry of the Freemasonry used to build earthly structures. Today, Euclidean has devolved to be the geometry of materialism. You can see in this list some of the other geometries. It is my hope that this webinar will give you a foundation to grasp sacred geometry. On his deathbed, Steiner wrote in letter 24 to the members, the cosmos reveals itself to man in the first instance from two sides, the earth and outside the earth, the universe of stars. To earth and her forces, man feels himself related. Life teaches him this relationship with great distinctiveness. Not in the same way does he feel himself in the present age related to the star world about him. This, however, only lasts so long as he remains unconscious of his ether body. To lay hold of the ether body in imaginations is to acquire the same feeling of kinship with the starry universe as one has through the consciousness of the physical body with the earth. But along with the ether forces that rain down upon the earth from the circumference of the cosmos, there comes also those cosmic impulses which work in the astral body of man. The ether is like an ocean on whose waves from all sides out of the farthest worlds, the astral forces come sailing to the earth. Now, I find this to be a fantastic introduction to what we're going to cover. We will be talking about the very things that he just brought up from the perspective of geometry. Now, back in your teens, you might have asked, why should I study geometry, mom and dad? Today, those of us here might ask, why should I study geometry if I want to learn about spiritual science? George Adams addressed this question saying, geometry should be among the first steps upon the way of spiritual knowledge. It serves as the foundation for a newborn spiritual knowledge, a newborn spiritual knowledge. It can bridge from one's inner essence to the spatial. This modern geometry, as Adams called projective geometry, deals with fundamental polarities, such as physical and etheric, earth and heaven, earth and sun, the point, the plane. For more on this, I recommend Adam's book, Physical and Ethereal Spaces. Why did the Platonic Mystery School focus on geometry? Steiner offered this perspective. Plato and the Gnostics recognized that geometry teaches one to effect a strict mental self-education where sense perceptions are no longer there 
to control his wrong associations of ideas. Mathematical science teaches the way to become independent of self, uh, sorry, of sense perception. And at the same time, it teaches the surest and safest spiritual path. Indeed, its truths are acquired by super sensible means, and they can always be confirmed in the realm of the senses. Even when we make a mathematical statement about four dimensional space, our statement must be such that when we leave the fourth dimension and restrict the result to three dimensions, our truth will still hold good as the special case of a more general proposition. One more quote from Initiation and Mysteries. The fact that Plato would not introduce into the higher stages of wisdom anyone who was ignorant of geometry does not mean that he was only admitted, only admitted trained geometers into his school, but rather his students needed to be familiar with serious, rigorous, and exact research before the mysteries of spiritual life could be revealed to them." End quote. Steiner goes on to point out that concepts of geometry help to awaken clairvoyant abilities. And I find it interesting that Leonardo da Vinci, who was part of the Academia Platonica of Florence, when he moved to Milan, he tried to found a similar school and in order to develop its geometry, he hired Italy's leading geometrician, Luca Pacioli. The Pythagorean school preceded that of Plato's. Here, the form of certain solids was considered to be sacred. Even before ancient Greece, the Chaldeans, Babylonians, and Egyptians studied how forces from the heavens gave form to earthly objects. And with the rebirth of Greek culture during the Renaissance, painters brought new knowledge that led to knowing how to depict on a 2D canvas, a 2D canvas, a 3D object, so that it appears as the object is seen in the physical realm. We should keep in mind throughout this talk that when we speak of forms, we are speaking about creations of the exousiae, or in Hebrew, Elohim. So the basic geometric terms are points, lines, and surfaces, or planes, and also triangles, which are the first to define an enclosure. Next, with 3D objects, we have forms. A common term here is solids, like platonic solids, which already implies something physical grasped with materialistic ideas. Do we stop with 3D? Is there a fourth dimension? What about a fifth? Does this take us to foundations for a healthy, mechanical occultism, where machines will operate based on detecting certain moral vibrations from its human user? What are vibrations? A wave is a perturbation of a 2D surface causing movement. Who are the spirits of movement? Yes, the dynamis, who are one stage higher, then the Elohim or Exousiae, who are the spirits of form. Throughout the ages, esotericism has expressed itself in symbols and stories. We can see the use of symbols to represent spiritual knowledge as a kind of hieroglyphic writing that becomes a way of expression, a language of the spirit. Alchemists were familiar with this language. Symbolism reached a height during the Egyptian Chaldean cultural age. We can say that during the time that our spiritual organs of perception faded, the use of symbols emerged to replace 
that which was lost. In our fifth post-Atlantean cultural age, those spiritual impulses that began during the Egyptian cultural age must be brought to a completion. There's this kind of spiritual law that what began in one goes through the fourth and then you know, the third has to be completed in the fifth, the second and the sixth and so on. <clears throat> so um, before founding Anthroposophy, Rudolf Steiner started and oversaw a Masonic order based on Egyptian lore and spoke about a future masonry that would work upon the living as it has worked upon the lifeless. Many founders of America were prominent members of Freemasonry. Lots of speculation has been shared on why this symbol is on the back of the US dollar, and I'm not gonna to try to answer it. And symbols are, have found their way into literature and even children's stories. From the Wizard of Oz, we hear Dorothy cry out her threefold fear, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. In this new realm of Oz, she meets and befriends three as symbols. The scarecrow, representing farming and culture, which needs thinking, that is, free thinking. The lion, representing the political or right sphere that needs courage to bring equality into the social life. And lastly, the tin man for industry that needs a heart, that is brotherhood. And just as scary as those lions and tigers and bears, oh my, can be, so can geometries, points and lines and planes be. A point has no dimensions, only position. The movement between two points defines a line. The line is one dimensional. When a line is moved, it defines a plane, which is two dimensional. And if we move a plane, it defines a solid, which is three dimensional. For this discussion, please use your imagination. If you were a one-dimensional being, you would exist within a line. Okay, so now, now picture yourself there. What could you perceive, assuming you had some organ of perception? You could perceive only points. To perceive your line or any other line, you would have to stand up, which would mean up into a second dimension. Now, if you were a 2D being existing within a plane, you could perceive only lines, that is one dimension objects. Likewise, as a 3D being, you could perceive only planes. Thus, for us to perceive 3D objects, which we do, we must be 4D beings. Let me repeat that we have found that for us humans to experience three dimensions, we must be four-dimensional beings. So what is this fourth dimension? Or I answer that lastly, to take something from one dimension to the next, as we just saw, required a kind of movement. We can move a point in one direction to make a line. We can move a line in a direction to make a plane. If we take a strip of paper representing a plane and move it so that the two ends meet, we get a cylinder. We'll continue with this theme of movement. Here we have two 2D images that are symmetrical. If you are a 2D being, that is in this plane, can you stay in the plane and make these two images coincide? Sure, you say, just slide the one image in a half circle around that line and up, right? Well, not if north and south are different. Something in our mind can easily assess this and do it. What are we doing? We are mentally moving one over the other. Now watch. 
we flip the image over and then slid it, or we could have slid it and then flipped it over. The flipping it over is taking it out of the second dimension and into the third dimension. Now let's look at gloves. We can flip or move through a different dimension, the left one over to coincide with the right one. But what if the um, front of these gloves has a leather pad? Flipping will no longer work because the fronts are different than the backs. But if our mind can still easily see the symmetry and mentally perform any necessary movement, this confronts us with a question. What is symmetry? What is spiritual gestures? Is its source Gemini? It is a trait of the etheric realm. When we see a deformed symmetry, as in this crab's claw, we can say that the astral has played this altering role. Now we'll go into some fascinating characteristics of movement. Earlier, we formed a cylinder by gluing the two ends of a ribbon. Now we'll do this with movement in the form of twisting a ribbon 180 degrees to make a Mobius strip. It is interesting that DNA looks like a strip that has been twisted. In your imagination, follow a line in the ribbon. It will be on the outside for half the ribbon and on the inside for the other half. Do you see that yellow line and follow it around? Similarly, we can form an ovoid by taking two circles you see there where each penetrates the other to its center point. And then we flesh this out. So we use those two as a kind of skeleton. So it looks like two intersecting clamshells. Such an object can roll almost as easily as a sphere. But unlike the straight line of the movement of the sphere, this will make waves on sand or something as you move it, similar to a sine wave. Thickening and rigidifying that Mobius strip leads to this rollable object that has been called an anti -oloid. Now, all these are fascinating to observe and experience. One could claim that they represent breathing for what was outside becomes inside. And then what was inside becomes exhalation and outside. Such a form expresses a kind of continuum. Now the Renaissance painters studied and perfected how to represent in three dimensions on a 2D surface, for example, a painting on a canvas. First, the artist determined where on the horizon this object was meant to converge. So we pick this point and you can see our parallel lines converge at that point on the horizon. Now here I'm going to represent train tracks. So I'm going to add to these train tracks, these ties, and you can see that the distance between the ties actually has to reduce a little bit as we go towards the horizon. And eventually that distance becomes so small you can no longer see it. And the track, it would just look like steady brow into the horizon. Knowing this, some Renaissance architects spooked city residents to believe that their building was taller than it was by reducing the height as they went up of successive floors. I can express this another way using a point that radiates, that is a point of lines. We'll draw another horizontal line to show where these rays shine upon this horizontal line, of course, where they intersect. All this will be in two dimensions. If we start on our left and sequence through these rays to the right, we find that for each degree change in the circle, the movement along the horizontal line changes more dramatically. So just like the change in distance between the railroad ties, as we come 
to the vertical, the movement of points along the horizontal line slows. But as we then proceed past the vertical towards the right, the point of intersection moves rapidly to the right. Eventually, our ray becomes horizontal, parallel to that line of intersections below. In modern Euclidean geometry, it would say that parallel lines do not meet. So when the ray and the horizontal line became parallel, Euclidean geometry defines this as a discontinuity. In projected geometry, we do not have discontinuities. Thus, these two met at infinity. Now we can continue drawing rays in the opposite direction. What might we call these? Rays of gravity? It begins with the same march of rays just completed below until we come to the left horizon, and then we return again with lines or rays that intersect on that horizontal line below. So now we can take what we just learned here in 2D to an example of 3D. So here we're just going to talk real briefly before we go into that about what building blocks we have here for geometry. In the physical, we have a line and a point, and together these define a plane. In the etheric, we have a plane that is met by a line that generates a point. We can ask, what's in the middle? The mediator between points and planes are lines. What makes the physical? Particles we consider as points, atoms as points, or today subatomic particles as points. In the physical, we start with a point and try to build up from the point to what we see. What would be the equivalent for the etheric? There, we start with planes. In the physical, forces radiate in rays, and to these lines, we associate qualities of will. In the etheric, lines weave through planes to create forms and pictures. Here, in the etheric, we associate such lines with the life of thought. In the physical, Points are the parts of a line. In the etheric, planes are the parts of a line. Let me repeat that. In the physical, points are the parts of a line. In the etheric, planes are the parts of a line. So now this next will make sense. So here you see that line and it's radiating lines from the point. And now I'm going to convert this to 3D. So I draw this dotted line and I change that intersecting line to an intersecting plane. And now from this dotted line, I start drawing planes. And you can see how these planes do just what the lines did in the previous example. And they will go all the way out to when they become horizontal, the plane, to that intersecting plane. And then they'll sweep around from the other side again. So if we were to look at that from the side, the sequence of planes that shear a line will look something like this. And I gave you another example in the physical world, this air filter has something very similar. Here we have a line a one-dimensional object. I have labeled some points, A and B, on the line. Now, how many segments do we have? Well, we have the one between A and B, and others would say we have one from infinity to A and one from B out to infinity. That would be true in Euclidean geometry, but here we have to talk about two segments. The segment between A and B and the segment from B wrapping around through infinity back to A. Now I'm going to take A and B segments and pull them down to make a circle. 
And I'm going to add now C and D and do the same thing, E and F and do the same thing. And if I keep going, making these circles, eventually I'll make such a big circle that it will stretch all the way out on that horizontal line that you see on the top from infinity on the left to infinity on the right. So the circle lost its curvature and became a straight line. But I also have this other straight line that the circle went to. So when the circle reached infinity, it also looks like these two tangential lines. But what about all the other points on the circle? I could have done this with any two tangential line. So when that circle reached infinity, it encompasses all of the tangential lines. And to add to this, if I were to say, if I go out to the right and things get warmer, then when I come back from the left, everything needs to be getting cooler. When I drop a pebble into a still lake, a series of waves are generated that expand outward from the point where the pebble entered the water. The 2D surface becomes three-dimensional when the waves travel on it. As each wave circle widens, the crest of the wave diminishes so that if we stood on the other side of the lake, we likely would not notice these waves coming to us even though they do reach us eventually. We just saw that as a circle expands so that its diameter becomes infinite, that it lost its curvature and became flat. It becomes a line. Well, actually we saw it became all lines that are tangential to the circle, but there are you know, an infinite number of these lines because there's an infinite number of points in the circle. So if we now take the circle as a sphere and do the same thing, when we expand the sphere, it comes out to these planes, these two planes that are parallel to each other at infinity. And so we see that these two planes at infinity are actually the same plane at infinity. In fact, all the planes at infinity have to be the same plane. So when we start talking about the etheric realm, we come from planes or the sphere at infinity inwards. The waves now contract inwardly. They move towards the center point. This picture is kind of like a mirror of the last one. Or we might even say it's like an inside out image. We first had a diagram of a point radiating out like a star. Here, the movement is inward to that central point, a point of inner infinity. Such a point has both no volume as well as the volume of the infinite sphere when it is turned inward. So light physically rays down to us from the stars and etherically it seeks the infinity of each point here on earth. Of light, Steiner spoke of it as something existing in the fourth dimension with its four dimension, its fourth dimension being inwardness. From the end of the etherization of the blood lecture, there's a Q&A, and I'll read it to you. The question was asked, what is electricity? To this, Steiner answered, electricity is light in the submaterial or sub-physical state. Light is there compressed, compressed to the utmost degree in inward quality, who must be ascribed to light. Light is itself at every point in space. 
warmth will expand in the three dimensions of space. In light, there is a fourth. It is a fourfold extension. It has the quality of inwardness as its fourth dimension. We will now study how to move 2D shapes into a 3D form. I'll take an example from the field of packaging science. Yes, shipping industry work, which tries to find two-dimensional forms to make effective 3D shipping boxes with little waste. Here we see that we could make a 3D box from this 2D structure. The four sides around the middle square are first folded upwards at a 90 degree from that middle square. This makes the two bottom squares to go up vertically. And then all we have to do to make the box is that top square, we fold it down to make a cube in this case. If you are a two-dimensional being, you could move all around this form, but you could never see that middle square. You had to go into 3D to be able to see it when we you know, can look at it from above or convert the 2D into a 3D. Steiner remarked that allowing such to work upon us, this leads to knowledge of the super sensible. So before we jump into 3D, let's get in mind this list of 2D shapes or polygons. This list goes up to only a 10-sided shape. There are more, of course. We can say that each shape, each side of a shape defines a line. So you see these two lines I drew on the pentagram. And it would, of course, have five edges defining five such lines. Here I'm showing a hexagon made by wasps. Honeybees also use the hexagon. Of course, this is actually a 3D form with six sides, like a six-sided cylinder. These pack together without any spatial waste. While a circle and an ellipse are two-dimensional, neither has a side to define a line. So just as we saw before with the circle, both have tangential lines for every point on its boundary or circumference. So they have an infinite number of points on its circumference and thus an infinite number of tangential lines. The five-pointed star is a special form comprised of a pentagram plus five triangles. This can be especially helpful to be done as a eurythmy exercise in order to experience etheric forces. So you get five participants to each stand at one of the five points. First, they contract towards the center where I drew that circle, and then they start migrating uh, as a circle to the uh, counterclockwise, shall we say, and until they reach a point where they can walk backwards to the next point, which isn't the next successive, but the second one after that. Then one walks backwards, so that the five-pointed um, star, the five, expand, and then, again, move past one point to the point beyond. And you keep doing this expansion contraction around it. And you'll be surprised if you ever get to do this, how awake you have to be, because you're moving in different dimensions. You're not only contracting, but then expanding. And you're not moving simply to the next point, but to the point after that. And you have to cut, you know, walk inward and walk backwards to that next point. So you have to have a good sense walking backwards, how far back where that point is. So I also drew these other two, to one symbolizing goodness and the other can be a symbol for the two-horned beast of the apocalypse. The fifth age, as well as our fifth epoch, 
are a time when humanity's strength is tested by the release of evils that must be overcome by us. When people hear sacred geometry, it often means drawing a complex of lines to create very pretty pictures such as this. A two-dimensional dodecagon, because this isn't a dodecahedron, this is a gon, not a hedron, was the base here. 11 lines are drawn from each node. Repeating this at intersections causes such intricate designs to arise that most people find quite beautiful. Others find these to be expressions of cosmic wisdom. When we take a circle into three dimensions, we have a sphere, of course. Plato called the sphere the most perfect form. As you might have noticed, I'm using the word form for 3D and shape for 2D. Interestingly, the sun and the planets seem to attempt to be spheres, albeit a bit distorted from perfect spheres. If we have a point that radiates a line, such as a sun, upon this sphere, it will illuminate roughly half the sphere. The sphere will cast a shadow. An eclipse of a moon happens whenever the moon passes through this constant shadow from the earth. If we take a two-dimensional circle and we move it perpendicular to another circle, you know, that we, so we put a, draw a circle on a piece of paper and we move this other circle around that, a torus results. You know, when we stir a biodynamic prep in a bucket, we get a vortex in the middle. If we try to follow the cone of that vortex, it dives down toward a point below. Now imagine what happens after this point is reached. Where does it go? Well, if a vortex reemerges with symmetry from below, then this type of torus forms. In these forms, movement was movement again was used to manifest the form. And it's very pretty to see this in movement so that you see you know, the vortex above and then this vortex we might say in the etheric below. If an object were moving in a line, but some point pulled the object towards it, it would follow a path like this. We can think of a spiral as the movement of an impulse that modifies over time. It comes to its goal by circulating around it as it comes closer. We might think of a labyrinth as based on the principles of a spiral. Is a straight line necessarily the shortest path? What about when we're not in the physical world? We find spiral forms in nature. Instead of spiraling in, this form seems to be spiraling out. Dual spirals are common. Here we see one from Waldorf education. And this is a galaxy. The two impulses maintain a kind of balance in symmetry as they strive either inwards to the center point or outwards from it. In forms, we look for polarities that attain a balance. The earth and the planets as they travel within the solar system and then within the galaxy draw screw-like paths. There are some wonderful videos showing this and I have just a still picture here. We could say the staff of Mercury is similar to a sun moving around which two entities or two planets spiral. Here you see a cube. Well, note that the mind can also see this differently. Can you see this as a, um, uh, a sort of floor here and a wall and a wall. 
So that's the farthest point away. You can also see this as this being the point closest to you. And these are the three faces of the cube that's pointing towards you. This somewhat imperfect hexagram with its diagonal lines drawn can appear as two different three-dimensional cubes. Do you see both cubes? Previously in the 2D to 3D box examples, lines define the edges or sides of the finished geometric shapes. Here with 3D forms instead of lines, we use planes to define the um, facets of the form or the surfaces, um, these lines of intersection for spherical forms or cylinders. Let's return to the theme of symbols and the role therein of geometry. But remember, God geometrizes. Steiner asked us to try to see these forms not as rigid forms but as the result of a space creative process. With each form we ask, how many faces does it have? We'll start with the cube, it represents the earthly. It has six faces. And besides earth is sometimes, it's sometimes used to represent salt in alchemy. When we measure a volume, we speak about cubic feet. Along with the cube, the other platonic solids are the icosahedron with 20 facets, and it represents water, the octahedron with eight, air, and the tetrahedron with four facets representing fire. Steiner remarked that fire is the gate through which we penetrate from the outer plane to the inner. The fifth platonic solid is the dodecahedron with 12 facets representing the ethers. Plato was excited by the dodecahedron, calling it the quintessence that describes the cosmos. Euclid at the end of his Elements, Book 13, Prop 17, explains how to construct the dodecahedron and how to inscribe it in a sphere, the sphere of the universe, the sphere of the zodiac. The regular dodecahedron is composed of 12 equal pentagrams. As a platonic solid, it represents the ethers. Try to imagine how one might start with a 2D sheet of cardboard and cut out a form that could be folded up into a dodecahedron. It can be done. Irregular dodecahedrons can be constructed like these two. While having 12 facets, these would not qualify by Plato as a sacred solid because they are a mix of two dimensional shapes. Here we see the foundation stone for the Gertianum. We see that it is a regular dodecahedron and you see a second one formed with it. This form that you're seeing now has 32 facets. It's called a buckyball or a fullerene after Buckminster Fuller. It consists of 60 carbon atoms that form from a combination of hexagons and pentagons. It does not occur normally in nature, but it is easily formed today in the lab. Now, a tetrahedron is composed of four triangles, the triangular base and the three upright triangles. Now a pyramid is a mix of a square as its base and four triangles as its four upright sides. Steiner was speaking about volcanoes in a lecture and he described how the earth as a sphere has the fire form that is the tetrahedron inscribed within it as shown here. This tetrahedron of the earth has to be seen as a tetrahedron with rounded lines between the points. So here is how Steiner fit a tetrahedron into the earth. 
And here is how this rounded tetrahedron appears from below with the top point being Japan, presumably Mount Fuji. Plato associated the eight-sided octahedron with the element air. Like the tetrahedron, the octahedron is composed of triangles, here eight. Note that this is not two tetrahedrons, but two mirrored pyramids joined so that one points up and the other down symmetrically, up and down. It counts as a platonic solid because all of the outer shapes are identical triangles. The icosahedron has 20 equal faces with each being a triangle again. This represents the element water. If we move each face, that is a tri the triangle, out to a midpoint and connect these midpoints, we get this dodecahedron again. So look at the top five. So around the top are five triangles pointing upwards to that top point. And if you take the midpoint of each triangle and come out a little ways and then connect those five, you get in this picture here, these five points. And then the middle triangles become these 10 points that go around and then the bottom five triangles are these five around the base. I hope you can see that. We saw that the mediator between the point in the plane is the line. This shows a circle as spirit and a square as body. In three dimensions, these would be a sphere and a cube. So what is the mediator between spirit and body? When one becomes aware of the mystery, symbols such as these begin to speak. The triangle symbolizes heart, liver, and brain. Steiner tells us that in Devakan, they are radiant centers of force which stream out from the three points. And then in the astral world, these three points form a triangle. So as we come down from Devakan in the astral world, we um, have the three, the triangle. But then when we go up into Devakan, they become a six-pointed figure, the two interlaced triangles. So in the time of Aristotle, it was common knowledge that there were two parts of the soul, a spiritual part called active reason, wherein the intellection of the spirit life took place. This activity or noose was known to be immaterial and immortal. The other soul part was tied to the physical body. It apprehended sense perceptions. It arose as a necessary byproduct of man's parental inheritance. Each part would be a triangle. The two triangles together make the six-pointed star. As many of you know, in 869, there were some major changes to this philosophy by theologians of the ninth century. The Eighth Ecumenical Council decreed each of us has just one soul, and it is that part that is represented by the downward pointing triangle. Consequently, without the mediator of the spirit, we lost both the part of the soul that points upwards as well as the spirit. Oddly, this decree helped to prepare humanity for the attainment of freedom. Can we say that the two triangles used to represent these two aspects of the soul have changed in the course of evolution? Using the green one to represent its apex pointed down, that is to represent that soul part which deals with the body, and then the blue triangle, that part which deals with the spirit. Then this is how these two triangles might be arranged to represent the soul 
during the ancient Persian cultural age. We might even associate the cane soul gesture with the green triangle and the blue with Abel. Today, these two might be drawn in this way because physical senses are what we use um, to understand the world and we identify with one's physical body. So the physical body is overwhelming the spiritual. In the course of evolution, this is the goal for the, our future. Now we come to something very challenging. Keep in mind that we cannot physically see a four dimension object. We must use our imagination for this. You should know that this was quite difficult for me to draw this three dimensional object on a two dimensional surface using PowerPoint. Back in college, I could easily do this with the drawing tools in my introductory course in drafting. But with PowerPoint as my drawing tool, <laughs> this wasn't easy. So anyways, to go from 3D to 4D, we have to start with a 3D object that I've tried to re represent here in two dimensions. The cube is the easiest for this demonstration. OK. So how many cubes does it take to make a four-dimensional object? To answer this, a quick review of what we studied can help. We learned that it takes two points to make a line, four lines to make a square, six squares to make a cube. So following this re reasons, uh, it's reasonable to assume eight cubes to make a tesseract which would be a four-dimensional A, not all, but A, four-dimensional object. We have four jutting out cubes. So here you can see one, two, three, four, and we have four in the column, right? Well, although it takes eight cubes in three dimensions, we can see only seven of them. One point of this topic is that we have extended geometry to a fourth dimension. One must use their imagination to see how this four-dimensional geometry works. The other point is the willed thinking required to fold up this tesseract into a four-dimensional object. Just as we could fold up a 2D form into a three-dimensional box, so can we fold up this representation in 3D of, into a tesseract in 4D. Recall the packaging example where we folded up a 2D shape into a 3D box. There we could map out what edge would be shared once the box was folded into a shape. So there would be two edges. We could see where they would meet. Here, we need to see what faces will be joined. I've labeled these two faces A. These two faces, we have to be able to, in our imagination, see that they come together. They become a shared intersection between two adjoining cubes in four dimensions. And I can do the same with these B faces and so on with that face, um, which we might call the C faces. And we go around all the faces of that bottom cube to meet faces in the rest of the tesseract. So if we focus on movement, we can understand a lot about the kingdoms of nature. You see on the lower right, the worlds or planes, as Steiner called them, the human has its 3D body and its etheric, astral, and ego all present with this body while we're awake. The animal has its ego or group soul above in the astral plane. The plant has its group soul in lower Devicon, while the mineral has its group soul in upper Devicon. Because of this, 
the mineral has no option of movement while the plant can move, that is grow, in a line upwards, that is its trunk. The animal is given two degrees of movement, the physical and the etheric. And lastly, the human has the physical, the etheric, and the astral for its degrees of movement. In his lecture cycles, we might find some statements by Steiner about the non-existence of a four fourth dimension and easily become confused. Hopefully this explanation from the third scientific lecture cycle, the astronomy one, will help you should you stumble upon this contradiction. And here's Steiner's words. I'd like for you to consider not only ordinary space conceived in its three dimensions, but also a counter space or anti space. In ordinary space, I have left to right the first dimension, up down the second dimension, and front back the third dimension. You probably remember from high school geometry the Cartesian axes called x, y, and z. Steiner asserts that these are not interchangeable. In fact, he asserts that the cosmos has an egg shape because these axes are not the same. Now, as you know, in any such domain, you cannot only advance up to a certain degree of intensity, you can subtract from it too. And as you go on subtracting, taking away, you come at last to the negation of it, and then you keep going. So as you're aware, there's not only wealth, but debt, debt. So now imagine, the left to right axis as shrinking to nothing and then continuing into its anti-axis. A similar axis will appear, but it will be the axis coming the other way from infinity. The labels left and right no longer apply. Of course, it is possible to think of only two dimensions instead of three, but that is not the intention. What is meant is this. The reason why there are now only two dimensions is not that we never had a third. The reason is I had a third, and when I go to the higher state, it vanished. The two dimensions are an outcome of the coming into being and vanishing again of the third. I now have a space which, though it outwardly shows only two dimensions, must inwardly be, be conceived as having two third dimensions, two third dimensions, one positive and the other negative. The negative dimension springs from a source that can no longer be there in my three-dimensional space. Nor must I think of it as a fourth dimension in the conventional sense. No, I must think of it as being in the third dimension as positive is to negative. So hopefully this gives us a working concept of counter space or anti space. Now, some of you might say, hey, I'm still confused. So I'll read one other quote from Steiner to try to help those of you who may still be confused. Astral consciousness is four-dimensional in certain connections. So we're talking about astral consciousness. In order to form an approximate idea of this, the following may be said. Anything of the lifeless remains in its three dimensions. Anything of the living extends all the time beyond the third dimension. Anything that grows has its movement, the fourth dimension, within its three dimensions. If something moves in a circle, and if the circle it traces goes on increasing in size, we come at last to a straight line, as we saw earlier. But this straight line will not return to its starting point because our world is three-dimensional. 
in astral space, a line does return because astral space is closed on all sides. It is quite impossible there to go straight on forever. Physical space is open to the fourth dimension. Height and breadth are two dimensions. The third dimension leads out into the fourth. In astral space, a different geometry prevails. We can apply this to planes of consciousness. Recall that each dimension is also a polarity, like left, right, and so on. As we ascend, we will lose two polarities. So let's start with the physical plane, what is 3D. When we move up to the astral, we should be at 4D, right? We get a glimpse of this from those who have experienced near-death experiences. They report seeing the panorama of their life that Rudolf Steiner had described. But the images are, not, are in 2D, they're not in 3D. They're in a plane. We can scan our life from its end back to its beginning. We have lost two poles and thus it appears two-dimensional. When we raise our consciousness to lower Devakan, we might have thought this would be a 5D image. Again, we lose two poles, and now we're down to the line, one dimension. And finally, at arriving to upper Devakan, we find that its six dimensions is also no dimensions, the point. Again, we lost two poles. Now we come to be the point, and we can say we are, and truly say it, we are all one. I've talked about geometry in general. I've mentioned projective geometry. Some of you may have had some classes, and I've had just a few, so I'm no expert. And some of you listening in may be teachers of projective geometry. So one way to form a projection is to do a transformation of the points and lines existing in one plane onto another plane by connecting points on the two planes with parallel lines. This can be imagined as shining a light source located behind it, perhaps even at infinity, through a translucent sheet of paper that has an image drawn on it. So that on the second sheet of paper, a shadow of that image appears. And then you can start it you know, directly and you'll get exactly the same image. And then you can start tilting that other plane. The resulting shadow can take on quite different shapes as you tilt that second plane. I hope I perhaps created some interest in you to pursue projective geometry in more detail. And just a couple other comments about shadows. Shadows are such a projection. If we radiate light, does our light cast a shadow? If it does, where? With what effect? Can one lose their shadow? Our sun shadow is lost at high noon or after the sun is set. Is this why Steiner recommended meditation at morning and evening when our sun shadow is out of our body the most? Do spiritual beings have a shadow? From a spiritual perspective, if a rainbow is a real thing, is a shadow also a real thing? If so, what is the shadow of an object? Is it evil necessarily? Might this help us in understanding what Steiner meant by shadowy thinking? We recently had an eclipse of the moon. What does an, an eclipse mean? Well, most of you know, it's something passing through the shadow of something else. Is it an evil moment or can it be a time of release? Is a shadow similar to a mirror image? Do you have an inner mirror? The answer is yes. Steiner speaks about this inner mirror 
that um, is used to achieve spiritual perception, I'm sorry, sensory perception to become aware of it. And to achieve spiritual perception, we need to break this mirror. Here is a quote where Steiner speaks about breaking this inner mirror. An ordinary mirror reflects what is in front of it in space. Our living mirror, we, you know, reflects the sense perceptions and impressions we receive. This or that impression is reflected back into consciousness so that we have a memory of the past experience. If we break a mirror that is in space, then we can see behind it. Correspondingly, if we break our inner mirror, then the memories cease for a time while we can look more deeply into our inner being. As we do this, as we look within behind the memory mirror, then a kind of center and heart of destruction, heart of destruction meets our gaze. There must be such a center within us thus. For only in such a center can the ego of man establish itself. It is a center for the strengthening and hardening of the ego. However, if this results in egoism that is carried out into the social life, then ego ensues, evil ensues. Here you have something which has its good use and purpose within man, for otherwise we would not be able to develop our ego, but something which must never be allowed outside. One more little quote from spiritual, the philosophy of spiritual activity or the philosophy of freedom. Thinking all too readily leaves us cold in reflection as it is, it is as if the line of the soul had dried out. Yet this is really nothing but the strongly marked shadow of its real nature, warm, luminous, and penetratingly, penetrating deeply into the phenomenon of the world. This penetration is brought about by a power flowing through the activity of thinking itself, the power of love in its spiritual form. Plato was able to describe how our thinking based on physical objects is like the thinking of people chained, as was Prometheus, to the mineral kingdom. We see only shadowy thoughts. If we could break our chains, we could see into the spiritual world. We could see the reality behind the physical. Plato described the world with geometric figures. Pythagoras did too, but he emphasized numbers to begin with. The teaching of numbers in most Waldorf schools derive from the Pythagorean approach. Here is a number axis showing whole numbers that progress out to infinity. Now, each of these whole numbers has a counterpart in the numbers from one down to zero. In mathematics, we express this as one over n. So the counterpart of two is one half. For three, it is one third and so forth. We could say that the number one is a kind of vortex around which all numbers spiral. Oddly, there are just as many numbers between zero and one as there are between one and infinity. Likewise, there are just as many numbers between one and two as between any other two whole numbers. Infinity remains infinity. Adding or even multiplying infinity still gives us infinity. What does this tell us about infinity and about that point zero? And what does it tell us about one, that number from which Waldorf education mathematics begins? 
Oddly, this graph has some similarity to our number line. What is the minimal size for life to exist within a body? What might we learn if we numerically call the minimal size for life to be one? Is everything smaller subnature or subsensible? Does subnature only begin where quantum physics begins? I would say so. And subsensible begins sort of where this line below the, the minimal size in the physical for life to exist. Nanotechnology promises the tools to rebuild the physical world, even our bodies and our brains. And it, can, it says we can do this molecular fragment by molecular fragment and potentially even atom by atom. What it cannot promise is that there will be life in anything of what it builds. Scientists cannot answer the question, what happens to gravity when we go to the quantum level? Einstein's theory of relativity is formulated within the framework of classical physics, whereas the other fundamental forces are described within the framework of quantum mechanics. A quantum theory of gravity is needed according to physicists, in order to reconcile general relativity with the principles of quantum mechanics. The atom is nothing but coagulated electricity from subnature. Thought itself is composed of the same substance. Before the end of the fifth epic of culture, that would be the fifth age that we're in, Science will have reached the stage where man will be able to penetrate into the atom itself. When the similarity of substance between the thought and the atom is once comprehended, the way to get hold of the forces contained in the atom will soon be discovered and then nothing will be inaccessible to certain methods of working. He called this the third force, and many anthroposophists throughout the third, you know, the 40s and 50s wondered if this was atomic power. Steiner was asked about Einstein's theories, and he said they were right when considering only a certain perspective, a perspective that excluded the spiritual world. In his theories, Einstein showed that an object with mass would have, its, would have to have its mass increase as it approached the speed of light as shown. Likewise, time for this same object would slow down. Steiner also said that velocity is a real attribute of an object, but when we reduce the concept of velocity into distance divided by time, we lose this reality of velocity. In addition, Steiner indicated that there was not only positive space, as we just heard, but also what he called anti-space. And science has found this to be true in the case of matter. It has called something anti-matter. For mathematics to work, Steiner recommended that negative numbers be used for extending the physical into antimatter or into the etheric. One can create something out of nothing if what is created can somehow stay separated from its opposite that was simultaneously created. The sum of the two parts is, once again, nothing. That is, as far as we could tell from the physical. And that's true when a physical matter and its equivalent antimatter are brought together. They annihilate each other. To accomplish this, um, we move at the speed of light towards the y-axis. And so if I move now the speed of light to the y-axis um, to show this, I've made the speed of light zero. Where 
because I've moved it to where x is zero. In mathematics, this is perfectly allowable. It's called a translation of axes. Of course, Steiner's equations would have to be reworked if I do this. We don't have the time, and this would be a much better talk um, you know, if we did this, <laughs> this part sitting around a campfire. So perhaps it would be better to draw it this way. Here we see the x and y axes going off towards infinity and returning from the other direction. This might help us to understand a positive space and a negative space universe as being mirrors of each other, creations out of nothing whose sum is still nothing. In Steiner's last letter to members, he wrote about subnature and supernature. From what we've learned in this talk, can we gain some insights? Subnature as a mirror of supernature, so that light has become in subnature electricity. Cone has become the chemical ether, magnetism. The life ether has become a third force, perhaps the nuclear force. What is the relationship of sub to supernature? Is light a wave or is light a photon? Is it a wave while in the etheric and a photon once it enters the physical? Does the photon continue to become an electron when it enters the subphysical or subnature? What do we find in the astral world? Movement. Movement caused by desires, instincts, and of course the English word emotions. From Steiner, we know something about the etheric world with its four ethers, life, tone or chemical, that is the cosmic forming ether, the light ether and the warmth ether. And the Greeks studied the elements of the physical world, fire, air, water, and earth. Is this the end? Is there something below these elements? Yes, we come to the sub-physical ethers, electricity, magnetism, the chemical fallen ether, and that third fallen life ether. And now we can ask the question, is there also a sub-physical astral that is coming sometime in the future? I would like to make a quick comment about breathing, which unites our inner and our outer existence. Breathing expresses much of what we have just covered in that it unites the microcosm with the macrocosm within the physical plane. Early in Earth evolution, we breathed fire. Breathing today consists of inhaling air and exhaling water. This began during the Atlantean epoch and happens now and will continue into the near future. Our inhalation carries spiritual beings into us. Once these, were, these beings were associated with Yahweh, but today they are associated with different beings that Steiner calls anti michaelic beings. Into this air, we exhale elements of our morality upon our vapors. Below, our air breathing is blood circulation and digestion with its breathing of earth and water. Above, is our refined breathing of the ethers that combines with our air to be our thinking. In our perceiving, oxygen combines with silicon. In our forming of memories and mental pictures, we combine oxygen with carbon to make carbon dioxide. In the future, after the fifth epoch, all of this will ascend so that we will breathe light in our midst. You might be wondering, how was this talk enlightening about a path to the astral world? After all, that was in the title. The focus was on the etheric. Indeed, it was because we must come to know the etheric 
before we can explore the astral in a healthy way. If spirit is to be found in the astral world, then the physical world of sense perception cannot also be there. I'm quoting Steiner. What we experience there will have to be forces which have the inclination to destroy the physical world of the senses. This we experience in full force when we cross the threshold consciously. We experience with full force that in this astral world, we find what is forever inclined to destroy the physical world. I should mention that an anthroposophist, Hans Jenny, working with geometry, founded the field of cymatics, which studies forms that arise via vibrations and, and that come from various sounds um, and form these in liquids of various viscosities. If one undergoes consciously what otherwise has gone through only unconsciously between falling asleep and awaking, immersing oneself in the world that is the source of our rhythm, then the animal world and all its forms becomes comprehensible. This is from Therapeutic Insights. The animal world in all its forms cannot be explained by means of outer physical foundations or forces. If a zoologist or morphologist believes that the form of a lion, the tiger, the butterfly, the beetle, is able to be explained by means of something found in physical space, he is very much fooling himself. In physical space, one can never find an explanation for the different forms of the animals. One encounters the explanation in the way I've described it only if one enters the third lawfulness, the lawfulness of the world soul, end quote. The four lost lawfulnesses he described were one, the physical, two, the cosmic or etheric, three, the world soul or astral, Plane, and the fourth, the world spirit or Devakon. We focused on what the study of geometry can do for us to help us perceive in the spirit, first in the etheric, and now we can go on to the astral. Rudolf Steiner summarized his lectures on the fourth dimension with these words. We will always remain powerless in the higher world if we do not develop faculties that permit us to see in the higher world here, in the world of ordinary consciousness. The eyes we use for seeing in the physical sense perceptible world develop while we are still in the womb. Similarly, we must develop supersensory organs when we are still in the womb of the earth so that we can be born into the higher world as seers. Mentally constructing the relationship of the third dimension to the fourth dimension fosters inner forces that will permit you to see into real, not mathematical, four-dimensional space. So I hope that review allows you to see what we've just studied again. And these are what we've been through. And so I'll conclude <clears throat> with this cute little comic. Um, we've looked at how the dimensions change from physical to astral to devicon, meaning that how we grasp our perceptions must change as we ascend. We looked at some symbols and some form to grasp their meanings so that they could become a language for communications in higher worlds. I hope I've inspired some of you to pursue more on this subject. Maybe some of you who are experts will offer next level webinars for Andre in, in these series. I'll close with this quote from one of my favorite lecture cycles, Involution, Evolution and the Creation Out of Nothing. It goes like this. 
every human being is born into the physical world when he leaves his mother's body and frees himself of the physical maternal sheath. But we know that when this has happened, he is still enclosed in a second maternal sheath, an etheric one. During the first seven years of his life, the child's etheric body is completely enveloped in external etheric currents that come from the outer world, just as the physical body was enveloped until birth in a physical maternal sheath. At the change of teeth, this etheric sheath is stripped off and not, uh, not until now, at the age of seven, is the etheric body born. A clairvoyant can perceive the working of the etheric upon the brain. A plant, after reaching its puberty, cannot give birth to an astral body, for it has none. The higher animals and humans do. Next comes the birth of the ego in the 21st year. The higher animals have nothing more to do except to be its species, a lion, for example. But now the human can truly become a human. The seed or the point in geometry comes for the plant when it reaches its puberty and then dies. The seed for the animal maintains the species. The seed, that is the point from the perspective of the etheric, for the human also carries the species but goes further to prepare for the next life of the ego. Man alone can continually add something new to what is determined by karma. So let's go to our Q&A now. Andre, I'll give it back to you. And while we're doing that, I'll put up, for those of you who would like to have this, you can jot this down, um, you know, or make a screenshot or whatever. Um, I, I also mentioned last evening, Monique Pommier, um spoke from her book, Harmony, the Heartbeat of Creation, in one of the Mystech webinars. Um, and in another two weeks, she'll be doing um another one of these webinars <clears throat> so uh you're welcome if you don't know about the mystic webinars uh you can send me an email or go to mystech.org and i'm also showing that you can get this book and other of the books listed here at the rudelsteiner bookstore.com so andre do you have any questions yes well of course we do. Uh, I'm just uh, thinking how about take a three minutes break to stretch okay. our legs and have a sip of water. And uh, and you can actually rest a little bit. I need a drink, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, this session uh, is recorded. And dear friends, it's good news. Uh, when you're watching our lectures on YouTube, so you can uh, select um subtitles and to watch all lectures in your own mother tongue in your wow. language so in russian in slovenian in czech in uh, german so and uh, according to my expertise um, um translation by youtube is pretty good it's very good yeah so okay dear friends two three minutes and we will be back thank you Andrew, can you please stop to share your screen or, okay, it's fine. Mm -hmm.
Andrew, how are you feeling? I feel fine. I, I was uh, running out of water, <laughs> but um, yeah, you was you was super intense today. I think only Waldemar can beat you. <laughs> you mean in, in terms of time? <laughs> yeah, you gave us lecture one hour and thirty minutes. I know I went ten yeah. minutes over, <laughs> but I'm learning from the professor. I see, I see. Okay, dear friends, looks like we are back. Uh, so Andrew is back and he is fresh for your question. And um, if you can, um, <laughs> uh, so there is, uh, there is uh, a little icon, uh, reactions in your bottom on your screen and the biggest button is raise your hand. So, and I see Waldemar, Waldemar already raised his hand and, you know, yes, dear Waldemar, welcome, go ahead. Okay, well, uh, Andrew, uh, thank you very much for a very inspiring, very rich lecture. But I don't want to be the first to make questions. Uh, is there anyone that would like to make a question before me? <laughs> go ahead. Okay, now I want to, the first thing I want to say is that we, <clears throat> we have to be very careful of, of uh, what physicists say. For instance, it will never, if we, if we assume that there are atomic particles, we will never be able to know what an atomic particle, an atomic particle is in its natural state. That's very important to know. We'll never know what an atomic particle is. Why? Because we would have to extract some energy from it to observe it or insert some energy on it. But the, the minimal energy that one can generate and insert into such a particle changes its state. So physics will never know what an atomic particle is, right? This is, I think, uh, very important to know. Now, uh, another, another observation is that the name electromagnetic wave is wrong. Wave is a classical, uh, is a classical phenomenon in classical Newtonian physics. For instance, when you, throw a pebble into a lake, it forms waves, right? Why? Because the particles are the molecules of the 
uh, water, you know, one pushes and the, the other pulls the other so on and this propagates as if we would, uh, we would uh, fix uh, the end of a rope and then, uh, as I say, move the other end. Uh, end. Uh, but this is all phys uh, classical uh, Newtonian, Newtonian processes. Uh, when one speaks about electromagnetic uh, ir irradiation, radiation, that's the correct name, electromagnetic radiation, right? One should not say that it's a wave. It behaves as a wave when it interacts with, with matter. Steiner said that light is invisible. We don't see light. We only see its reflection when it reflects from when it interacts with matter and reflects, then we see uh, the light, not between the object and the eye. <laughs> you know, that's a metheric process. But uh, uh, so it's very important to, you know, to, to know what's behind what the physicists say. Now, Lino, could you uh, come back to slide 31? Would it be possible? I would mm -hmm. like to make an observation about the cube you, you showed. Just a sec, let me see if I can. Slide 31. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, if it takes okay, yes, long, Yeah, I've got it, I've got it, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me do this and current slide. Oh, and how do I now show task? This will be my third observation, and then I have a question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, share screen and um, share. Do you see the next one? <clears throat> okay. Where you showed the hexagon with the diagonals. Yes, that's what I want. Okay. Now look <clears throat> at the look at the hexagonal, right? I think everybody would say this uh, is a, an hexagon with uh, its diagonals, or one could say this is a representation of six triangles, right? Or some. Um, well, I don't know how to say that in English, it doesn't matter. So what is in interesting here is that one only sees the cubes when one has the concept of the cube. Right. If one has the concept of the cube, then looking at the hexagon with the diagonals, one can recognize the cube, the two cubes, right? Okay, so here is one, a very interesting uh, example that if we don't have the concept, we don't see. It is right. necessary to have a concept of an object to see it. And they, they, I used the hexagon with the diagonals in some of my lectures to show this phenomenon that uh, if one doesn't, if one doesn't, if one doesn't have the concept, one doesn't see what is being observed. Right. Thank you. And I have to. I have to. Thank you, because I have never thought of the three walls, the two walls and the ground. <laughs> I've never thought about that. That's very interesting, you know, very interesting. One can see a cube, one of the two cubes of the hexagon, and uh, the two uh, the two walls uh, with uh, the floor. Very interesting. I thank you for that. Well, and the question is the following. Steiner says that if one, uh, one wants to imagine the spiritual world, one should, one should uh, think of two dimensions. And this is very clear. With three dimensions, one has solids, one has matter. If one would have only two dimensions, there would be no matter anymore. Right? So, and, and, and also it is interesting that if one imagines that only two dimensions, right? One has only plane or uh, surface images, right? 
which is the first uh, consciousness, uh, you know, uh, higher consciousness, imagination, right? In images, right? So I was very, uh, I thank you very much for calling the attention to the fourth dimension. I've never had the curiosity of reading something by Steiner on the fourth dimension. What I knew was this reduction to the second, the two dimensions, which is, you know, something that we can understand. Oh yes, I could say something more about the fourth dimension. If I, one has a straight line or a line, and one wants to get into that line, one needs the th third dimension, right? One wants one uh, one wants to uh, make a movement into the line, so okay. one has to be outside the line and go into the line. Right. And for right. this, one needs the third dimension. Right. Now, if one has a cube, right, and one uh, wants to enter in, into the cube, one needs the fourth dimension. Right. That's why I Im can imagine the fourth dimension. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry okay. for being so long. Andre, back to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Omar. Omar. Yes. Okay, yeah, is next. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. You're muted. Oh, un unmute yourself. Unmute. Excellent. I wanted to thank you very, very much, Andrew, because your your talk tonight was not just inspirational, but aspirational. Because oh. it it makes, I think I can speak for, for everyone. It, it makes us realize what we can achieve. Thank you. And that is brilliant. Uh, I do not have questions because I'm too ignorant on the subject to make any consequential ones. But uh, I just wanted to point out the double aspect of inspirational and aspirational because you made it almost palpable. Thank you. Thank you for saying that, yeah. And the fact that you're still here after almost two hours of it, you'll get it. It's <laughs> the will is there. Okay, thank you so much. Andrew, uh, are you able to read from uh, chat box? Um, I suppose I can. So it's a question from Jim and, um, and from Well. As soon as we don't have uh, hands raised, so Jim? maybe you can answer those. Hey, Andrew, any comments about what a black hole is? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> you know, I have, this is campfire discussion, okay? So it, you know, you can't go say, Andrew Linnell said this, or he said that, you know, this is campfire discussion. You know, we're passing around stuff and having a good time. Um, and so, you know, I just am not the astrophysicist to, to, to be answering this one, but it would seem possible that this black hole is what Steiner called the anti-space that is not having this radiation of light and so on that the sun does. It's at a state that is not radiating, but just this negative space that would be at the center. But uh, you know, I, I'm just conjecturing, but it's a fascinating question, Jim. Um, was there another one? I'm, I'm sorry, that probably, well, you know, hey, Jim, we'll have to get together and have a good, campfire and talk about it because maybe we'll come up with something but um could you please expand on the tesseract and its significance to our perception of the astral world yeah um if if you do that exercise where i showed those eight cubes and you try to do that pairing up, this face goes to that face. And, and trying to imagine that, it, you have to go out of three-dimensional space 
to do it. Um, and this is where it gets kind of weird. Is that space like what a person experiences who experiences a, a near-death experience? What's going on in a near-death experience when they see their whole life as a panorama? Have they been able to bring different facets of their life together um, to see it in that panorama? Um, you know, it's not a movie. <laughs> it's not a sequence, but it's all one panorama. Um, so something's been lost of dimension and something added. Uh, and and so for this tesseract, I've tried to do this um, exercise of bringing those facets, you know, this one up and onto that plane. Um, and I can't say I've been overly successful, but I can feel how it will help towards perceiving this astral world to be able to actually have you know to get to a higher stage in one's perception so if we're able to perceive three dimensions and move as we do within it we've got to be four-dimensional beings already and to go into the astral we're going to have to go yet higher um no i don't think that answered your question val but i'm sorry that's about as good as i can do on that one um there's another question we've got a hand raise. So why don't we take Victor right now, if you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Him. Victor, please. Unmute myself here. Very interesting. I mean, it's I. I didn't know what to expect coming in with this title, but I, it more than fulfilled what I wanted. I have to reach back to my college days when I actually ran into Steiner for the first time, um, uh, and I was trying to seek this idea of fourth dimension, and I ran into some occult literature and the approach they had, and I just the question I have comes out of this, is the statement I think was said that what is space in one, what is time in one dimension becomes space in the next. And the idea was used that there's a grub that comes to out of its egg in the ground. And so it's got a point as its experience, but then it starts to climb. So it has a forward and back motion that in time can move in another direction. So that second dimension becomes the process of time where it's able to migrate in one space, one line. Suddenly it finds itself perhaps some, uh, out on a leaf or on the ground and suddenly it was able to see and move in three directions and therefore is able to create through time a, an experience of a third dimension. So the whole idea in this whole process was that there's a relationship between time and space, wherein we have a three-dimensional experience of space right now. Mm -hmm. But if you want to look into the astral world, and at that time I was struggling with what this astral world was, because I was having out-of-body experiences with nobody, no medical people, nobody could explain what was happening. Every night it was, uh, I, was, I was having this transitional experience where I clearly understood that there's something, that there's a next thing happening there. But then it made sense to me that maybe there's a time element and I think as I've studied with Steiner more, there is the process of entering into the idea of reincarnation is actually a new dimension mm -hmm. uh, that one doesn't have in physical, in our you know, day-to-day -day life. But over time, one gets a sense of this other dimension wherein you have been born from another experience and are going to be reborn in the future. And that time dimension then will create this fourth dimensional experience. I wonder if you can just see, well, have you heard anything related to that? No, I haven't. But, but I, I have thought about something similar to this, Victor, where, you know, after death, we go through all the inner planets until we come to the sun. We're there for a while. Then we move to the outer planets and then finally to the midnight sun. And then we want to come back again. And I'm questioning that whole thing. When we first die, we go through Kamaloka in the sort of moon sphere. And 
And it's just like you were saying, it seems to be that time and space have become all part of the same experience. We seem to have lost some depth or something, but they, you know, we see it all in Kamaloka. And now as we progress up, are we going through lower Devakon, higher Devakon? And do we become essentially by the time we get to the sun sphere, have we become a point? Yeah, that's a, to me, and this is one of the other people who asked or made a point about this. You know, I just finished the karma lectures uh, yeah. a few days ago, and in it somewhere, he discusses this idea instead of becoming fourth, fifth, and sixth dimensional or whatever, we return to second dimensional and then first to that point. And it was rather counterintuitive to me after all these years of looking at this, what is looked in the esoteric sort of literature is trying to expand out to the fourth dimension and the fifth dimension. It seems almost like Steiner is saying this new dimension actually is a return to, when you look at the, the tableau, when you die, is actually right. two, two dimensional experience. And then you finally come to that point. To me, it, yeah, it, it's puzzling. And I haven't, I haven't quite integrated those two directions, one of trying to create the multidimensional experiences. And yet, you know, your, your solid, your platonic solids, is, what a fascinating study this is. I mean, that to me, all those things do have a spatial orientation and, you know, they're very physical, but then you try and create this tesseract or whatever. I have no idea how you even imagine that, but it seems to me then you're pushing into something that is more dimensions than three, I guess. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. I, th I'm, I, I think that's good thinking. And I, I keep going. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, you, you know, I, I, I hope out of this, Andre will have lots of presenters in the future. Um, Valdemar mentions, we perceive concepts with our thinking. This is very extensively expounded in the philosophy of freedom. And yes, um, thank you, Valdemar. Uh, and we have a comment from Val. Are there any correlations between astral emotions and geometrical shapes? Boy, I'd have to give that some thought. You know, when we look at the symbol of fire, um, a tetrahedron, do we see in it something that if we have the emotion of anger or rage, for example, um, might we in our intuition draw something similar to a tetrahedron to, if we were told, draw what that emotion feels like. And if we tried to go to um, something that, you know, an emotion that's sort of flat, mm -hmm. watery and, uh, Phlegmatic or something, might we come to try to draw something that's more rounded, maybe an icosahedron or something like that? So I don't know. I, I think that could be a fascinating study, Val. I'm no expert on that, but I think you're on to something. So good question. Uh, dear friends, more questions? Lynn, Linda Our McEwen question. seems to, I saw her raise her hand. She doesn't, and she's not sure she knows how to unmute, I think. Oh, Linda, Linda, go ahead, Linda. Just unmute your computer, please. Thank you. I can't, I'm, I'm on an iPad and I couldn't find the little hand. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. Thank you, first of all. It's been an incredibly engaging talk. And I'm just very struck by this last bit about the relationship between emotion and shape. Because I'm a psychotherapist and I've been a psychotherapist for about, 35 years now and I'm just entering this territory that you're exploring Andrew oh, but I really see uh, that these these aspects have to come together because they it's trying to get some kind of relationship between how we experience the moral aspect of the, of the forms which is what you were just touching on 
Yeah. Because there must be a moral aspect to every shape and form. Right. And we know that with colour. And then and knowledge of higher worlds, um, you know, Steiner says that when you become clairvoyant, it's not that you actually see the colour blue or red, but you need to be ex- able to experience inwardly the yeah. nature of that colour. So if you then move from colour to form, we've got the same principle that somehow um, there's a moral dimension to form that we need to learn to be able to read. And that when these two worlds come together, the, the moral dimension and the, or what you've just been bringing this evening, which you have been bringing in the moral dimension, but I'm talking in terms of the inner development of a human being morally, I think we'll be real. Then, then we'll have a truly moral technology. Um, so I'm looking forward to the exploration of how these things come together. Wonderful so, comment. Thank you. thank you, Linda. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. You know, so? just Linda, um, if you were to draw divine wrath, you know, and this is for everybody, you know, what what might you what might that shape look like or that form look like? And it's interesting with um, you know, the apostles at Whitson, they drew this, you know, the artist drew this, this sort of flame that, uh, because it talks about tongues of fire. Um, that's what the writer saw, tongues of fire. You know, what's the shape? It's interesting because when, when people draw, I mean, I'm not talking about divine Ratna, but when people, um, I often work with drawing, somebody allow people to draw the shapes and they will draw um, anger in, in shapes of fire and in points. Yeah. It will have points and sometimes very ragged points. Yeah. And the points will go up. Very rare the points will come down. They'll radiate yeah. up and towards a, a center point, usually. I mean, I'm you know, yeah. But you could you could then work with the you know and an, a harmonious something that's more harmonious will in, 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 be inclined to go towards a more circular shape. So, you know, I, I've hundreds of drawings over the years, and you'll see these forms appearing again and again and again and again. So, yeah, I think huge uh, area of exploration here. Thank you. Yeah, it is. So, oh, dear friends, uh, we are working already two hours. Um, yeah. Is it good time to stop our? Oh, Leon. Okay, Leon. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I have uh, lots of questions, but I'll just ask one that came to mind, right? Just one. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's kind of small. Uh, <laughs> hello, Andrew. <laughs> Hi, Leon. Uh, Space and time, you know, you know in, in Einstein's idea, we have four dimensions and like H.G. Wells, I think said, there's only, the only difference between time and the other three is that our consciousness moves along that one. And um, so I, I recall reading Steiner as saying that we must not confuse time with the three dimensions of space. They're very different. And as a sub part of that <laughs> question, I, I remember reading in Ouspensky, or, or maybe it was Gurdjieff, um, he talked about the different dimensions of time. So he talked about prediction uh, and uh, pre- foreknowledge. So you're driving along a road and you can see in front of you you're on that line. And maybe you have um, a map and you can see two dimensions. And then if you go up in a, say a a balloon, you see the landscape around the the road and, and so on, and you can predict even more. You think there's anything to that idea? Or would that be time, or would that be another dimension altogether? 
there have been many who have mentioned we have, um, you know, in history, have had different mm -hmm. perceptions of time. And in, in ancient times, um, you know, we had a sundial and we then took that sundial, made a round clock, put 12 objects around it and time moved in space because the clock, you know, like the, like the shadow moved in space. Um, so we associated time and space from, from a long time. Um, science has taken that all the way down to using, um, you know, how, how fast do certain radioactive particles degrade um, to create, here's, you know, microseconds, milliseconds, and so on. Um, in, in the computers, we use crystals to um, create clocks. Uh, so, um, there are all these different things, and I'm sure psychological, right, Linda? Uh, you know, we have that expression. Oh my God! You know, when I was so when I was five years old, each year took twenty years, and now that I'm eighty, each year takes five seconds. You know, it's it, 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 the experience of time changes. So. Uh, yeah, I think there are different perspectives. And when we are in Kamaloka, I don't think we go, okay, let's see, I live 90 years, so I'm going to be here 30 years. You have no idea. It's not, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether it's 30 years for you and three years for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, I've worked a lot on biological rhythms. And oh, yeah and orientation in space. So all the other questions <laughs> relate to that. We'll have to leave that to another time. Yeah, then we would take up cosmic rhythms and the co what's the cosmic pulse and how does that relate to the heart pulse and, and yeah. use that as time and all those sort of questions. Yeah, good. Very good, Leon. Yeah. So Andre, back to you. I got <laughs> I gotta go eat thank, dinner. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. You are so intense this time. Yeah, but thank you very much. Um, dear friends, I'm just answering uh, a question from Angela. Uh, yes, this presentation is recorded and it's going to appear on our website. You should uh, click on uh, happenings program and uh, there is a link. Yeah, and uh, I would like to us, uh, I would like to also invite you for a uh, presentation of um, uh, Florian Saido, our friend from Hawaii, Island Oahu, Honolulu, uh, Vice President of um, Anthroposophical Society in Hawaii. So this his uh, part two presentation, Good and Evil in the Light of Anthroposophy, which will be at the same time next Saturday, it will be, uh, what, um, November 26th. And shortly after him, on December, I'm sorry, not December, November 30th, we will have a workshop from uh, Ari Torrenson. Ah. Chicago and for everybody. So, but it's going to be unusual time. So it's going to be um, 11 a.m. Please remember, uh, Ari going to talk from Norway. So that's why it's 11 a.m. to our workshop uh, on approaching of trash code, which mostly relates to some kind of exercises and practicing. So. Yes, and um, uh, of course, I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, about time. Um, yeah, now we have um, uh, a winter time in, in US. So, and uh, please find link in my announcements in the very top. So it's, um, uh, it's linked to a website when you can actually uh, know what is your uh, local time in relation to time in Chicago or um, American Midwest or Canada, central time. Yeah. 
so this is all my announcements. Yeah, Andrew, thank you so much. Uh, we will watch your presentation again in slow motion from our website. <laughs> yeah, and um, yes, and uh, yeah, please uh, feel free to unmute your computers and say thank you by your own voice. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Oh, Andrew. Andrew. Oh. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Andre. Yeah, how's Andrew Wolpert going? So he, she disappeared already. Okay, friends, so I'm finishing the session. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs>